of Radio Free Humanity, the Marxist Humanist Podcast from deep within capitalist society. I'm Andrew Klein. Later in today's episode, you'll be listening to an interview that Gabriel Donnelly and I recently conducted with Yuval Idan, an Israeli leftist, about her post on Medium, which was titled, To My Western Leftist Friends From Your Leftist Israeli Friend. And it kind of is an open letter that calls out soft on Hamas attitudes from a large portion of the Western left. This post has gotten a lot of attention during the interview. Yuval mentions that it's gotten about 60,000 views at the time of that interview. But before we have the main segment, the interview with Yuval Ridan, we'll have a current events segment on Trump and fascism. Has Trump crossed the line into fascism? That's the view expressed by Tom Nichols, staff writer for The Atlantic, Never Trump Conservative, and I'm going to be pushing back against a number of things that he said. First, the current events segment, and then the interview with Yuval Idan. Please visit MarxistHumanistInitiative.org, the website of Marxist Humanist Initiative, to listen to past episodes of Radio Free Humanity, to learn more about the issues discussed in them, to post comments, and to donate to the podcast series. This podcast series is sponsored and hosted by Marxist Humanist Initiative, but the views expressed by hosts and guests are our own. They don't necessarily reflect the views or positions of MHI. Coming up, my current events solo talk. I'm recording this on December 10. I want to talk about a recent commentary in The Atlantic by Tom Nichols. The overall title is Trump Crosses a Crucial Line. Nichols says Trump has crossed the line into fascism. He wrote this on November 16, 2023, just five days after Trump's infamous vermin speech. First of all, I want to just give you like a flavor of what Nichols is arguing and then play what is wrong with this picture. Nichols begins by saying that he is a stubborn pedant about words and their meanings. So he dug in his heels when Trump's critics described him and his followers as fascists. They're authoritarians, some of them. They're illiberal, definitely. But fascism, according to Nichols, has a distinct meaning and denotes a form of government that is beyond undemocratic. So after Trump was elected back in 2016, Nichols warned against the indiscriminate use of the word fascism. He says, because I suspected that the day might come when it would be an accurate term to describe Trump, and I wanted to preserve its power to shock and alarm us. But with Trump's recent talk, the vermin speech, and all the rest, according to Nichols, Trump has now crossed one of the last remaining lines that separated his usual authoritarian bluster from recognizable fascism. He is now promising to be a threat to every American he identifies as an enemy, and that's a lot of Americans. Now we get Nichols' real beef with people who jumped the gun, called Trump a fascist, called Trumpism fascist before he did. He said the overuse of fascist quickly wore out the part of the public's eardrums that could process such words. Trump seized on this strategic error by his opponents, and they were able to wave away his Trump derangement syndrome, the -the over-the-top objections that Trump faced when he entered politics in 2015. The mistake of early overreaction, according to Nichols, and the subsequent complacency have enabled Trump in his efforts to subvert American democracy. The other part of what Nichols is getting at is There's good people on both sides, is his view. Although some of Trump's most ardent voters support his blood and soil rhetoric, in other words, fascist rhetoric, millions of others have no connection to that agenda. Some aren't aware, others are in denial. The same kind of trope has been very popular 
in the anti-neoliberal left, the soft on Trump left, publications like Jacobin, groups like uh, the Platypus. Personally, I've always tried to be careful about the use of the word fascism in connection with Trump. Typically said that Trumpism is a proto-fascist phenomenon and that Trump's instincts and go-to reactions are instinctively fascist. Also, Marxist Humanist Initiative, when we first warned about the extraordinary dangers of Trump and Trumpism in an August 2016 editorial, we didn't say this is fascism. We referred to Trump's totalitarian inclinations and things like the Trumpite Republican Party no longer being a normal conservative party. Quote, the underlying white nationalism, racism, xenophobia, and hatred now stand in front of us naked and brazen. I and MHI have kind of shied away from using the term fascism in connection with Trump, but not because this or that particular aspect of Trump or Trumpism doesn't exactly match Mussolini or Hitler. For instance, Trump has never had an organized paramilitary standing behind him. That's something that the soft on Trump left said again and again as a key difference. Nichols is also going there. He's saying that same thing. Those are not the reasons that I have steered away typically from just saying this is fascism, differences between Trump and Mussolini or anything like that. The reason is that I got serious points to make. MHI is making serious points. And I just don't want to allow critics to divert from these serious points with nitpicky terminological quibbles. So I try to say, and I think MHI tries to say, what needs to be said without falling into this trap of, is this exactly the right terminology? Nichols begins by congratulating himself for his precise use of words. Trump was not a fascist. He was a wannabe Caudillo. And then he was about to cross into fascism. And now he's crossed the line. My response to this is, there is no line. It's like saying 962 grains of sand is not a heap. 963 grains of sand, now you got a heap of sand. It's ridiculous. It's what Richard Dawkins has called the tyranny of the discontinuous mind. There's like this human tendency or penchant for putting in discrete boxes this is in the one box, this is in a different box, phenomena that are more continuous. For instance, Dawkins says that there is no firm dividing line between one species and another species. There's just intermediate links all between. So there is no line, first of all, between this is now fascism and it wasn't fascism before. There is no fascist essence. Umberto Eco talks about fascism in terms of Wittgenstein's idea of family resemblance. What is the essence of a game? There's all these different games, and they've got some family resemblance instead of there being some game essence that some things share and other things don't share. What you have to do when, when, when you think about something like fascism is look at the dialectic of development. Look at what's there potentially that has not yet fully expressed itself. You look at an acorn, you could say that's not an oak tree. But if everything goes right, it will develop into an oak tree. I totally disagree with Tom Nichols saying that people use the term fascism prematurely simply by virtue of the fact that Trump had not yet committed such serious crimes against people and such outrages that we would characterize those specific acts yet as fascism. The point was, the trajectory here is the trajectory toward fascism. Adolf Hitler did not begin saying, okay, I want to exterminate all the Jews. What he wanted to do was get the Jews removed from Europe, but since no other countries would not take the Jews, he had no solution left to eliminate Germany and Europe of Jews but mass extermination. So these things develop, and it's important to understand what the trajectory is. It's not an overreaction. It's not premature to warn of fascism. The people who see ahead and can see what's coming and talk about 
what is now in relationship to what it can become and is likely to become, those people should be thanked, not disparaged as having overreacted or as having pulled the trigger on the F word too early. Why is Nichols so concerned then to say, here's the right time to use it, here's not yet the right time to use it, and you should pull the trigger only at a particular moment. It has nothing to do with the substance of the matter. What's actually clearly involved in what Nichols is doing is marketing, messaging. When the word fascism got used at a certain moment in history to a certain segment of people, it seemed like an overreaction. Why? Well, among other things, those people were not looking at the trajectory of what Trumpism was likely to become, or they couldn't process that. They ignored. They were in denial. And you turn off those people by saying it too early, and then the shock value is gone when Trump, quote, crosses the line into fascism with his vermin speech and everything else. We got a lot of people who just can't get beyond this politics of persuasion. They can't get beyond the way we're going to try to save the country is by taking people in Trump's base and changing their minds or taking the people that are kind of on the fence or not paying attention, and we're going to turn them into you know people on our side. I haven't seen this working. I don't think it's going to work. Imagine that Hillary Clinton had never said basket of deplorables. Imagine Joe Biden had never talked about semi-fascism. And then all of a sudden, at the crucial moment, Tom Nichols says he's crossed the line into fascism. How many people would have their minds changed by that? How many people would have their minds changed because Trump's previous rhetoric moved from whatever it was into vermin talk and all that? I just don't buy any of that. What we need to do is stop worrying about messaging for the people in the middle on the other side. And what we need to do is build a mass movement of the people who are already understanding what Trumpism is, prepared to fight it, willing to be mobilized, and we need to engage in that mobilization. I'm not trying to argue that if Trump were to get a second term, it would just be more of the same as in his first term. No, it would be qualitatively worse. He's definitely out for revenge. He's got this 2025 project of a lot of people who could and are prepared to help him exact revenge and turn the United States into a totalitarian hellhole. But instead of calling out people who are prescient, who foresee where things are going, who warn in advance for the purpose of helping us maybe not get there to where it's going, but stop it before it gets there. Instead of calling out such people, they should be praised and looked up to. And that's what we need is foresight and an understanding of the development of things. This is Anne Jacquard from Marxist Humanist Initiative, or MHI. MHI aims to contribute to the transformation of this capitalist world by projecting, developing, and concretizing the philosophy of Karl Marx and its further development in the Marxist humanism articulated by Raya Donayevskaya. Today, amidst many wars, climate crises, economic, social, and political crises, is a moment to engage people in discussion of these ideas. In the U.S., we are faced with the threat of Trumpism triumphing in all-out authoritarianism, extinguishing our right even to carry on such discussions. MHI is dedicated to the task of proving theoretically that an alternative to capitalism is possible. We are distinguished by our economic analyses in which we do not merely assert but demonstrate that the only opposite to the current world economic system is its abolition and replacement with one not based on the production of, quote, value, close quote. Because capitalism cannot be fundamentally reformed, attempts to reform it lead to an intensification of state capitalism and not to socialism. 
We are not a political party, nor are we trying to lead the masses who will form their own organizations and whose emancipation must be their own act. But we have seen that spontaneous actions alone are insufficient to usher in a new society. We seek a new unity of philosophy and organization in which mass movements striving for freedom lay hold of Marx's philosophy of revolution and recreate society on its basis. Our ideas and actions, as well as our structure and rules, are guided by the interests of working people and freedom movements of people of color, LGBTQ people, other minorities, women, youth, and all those around the world who are struggling for self-determination in order to freely develop their own human natures. We have no interest separate and apart from theirs. To this end, we open our website and podcast to the widest possible dialogue with people around the world. We intend to practice as well as to espouse a two-way road between our organization and people outside it as essential to developing a single dialectic in the relationship of theory to practice and as a way to assure the survival of Marxist humanism. Our collective is working to create an organization so formally rooted in its philosophy that it will not succumb to diversions that may arise from personal agendas and that will be capable of developing and concretizing the philosophy over the long haul, regardless of who its members may be. It is no simple matter to create a democratic organization that is at the same time effective and able to resist efforts to divert it from its goals. We are aware that Marx never achieved an organization based on his philosophy and that Donevskaya's organization disintegrated following her death. But we have made progress in this matter with our principles and bylaws and by recognizing that Marxist humanism cannot be carried on by chance or by individuals alone. An organization is needed in order to test and prove ideas. We invite all of you to join us in this discussion and our initiative. Hi, this is Andrew Kleiman, and with me today is a frequent RFH participant, Gabriel Donnelly, a real stalwart. And we're going to be interviewing Yuval Idan, uh, who's here with us. She's the author of a 20, an October 25th post on Medium uh, titled, To My Western Leftist Friends, From Your Leftist Israeli Friend. She wrote that on October 25, and we're recording this interview on December 6, 2023. So welcome, Gabriel, and welcome, of course, Yuval. Hi, thank you. Welcome, Yuval. Thank you. The medium post that you wrote is kind of a letter to your Western leftist friends from a leftist Israeli friend. In addition to being a leftist Israeli, can you tell us some more about who you are and maybe more about what you mean by being a leftist Israeli? I was born and raised in Israel, and then I live in New York now and I work in tech, but I did used to be in the world of community organizing and nonprofit work before I transitioned to tech. I started getting involved in, I guess, activism or politics or whatever you want to call it back in Israel when I was in high school or early high school. And it's kind of inherently political environment in some ways, because as you're approaching the end of high school, you start talking about the military, right? You start talking about the army, which is required for everyone to join. And then when I um, actually finished high school, I ended up not going to the army, mainly for, you know, reasons related to the occupation. I ended up going to school in Massachusetts, and I ended up staying here ever since. Uh, when you were in high school, contemplating going into the army, and you were in contact with activists, what kind of activists were they? What were their, their politics and so forth? Yeah, so definitely the main topic would be the occupation. So it would be sort of anti-militarization activists and folks kind of, you know, working on things like Sheikh Jarrah in East Jerusalem, which is 
a neighborhood that's for years has been fighting against Jewish families trying to move in and, you know, displace them from their own neighborhoods. And then when you're in high school, you focus a lot on the army, a lot on trying to help people who want to not go to the army, try to support people who refuse to go to the army and end up going to jail. You make a distinction uh, uh, right from the get-go in, in, in your Medium post between uh, the Western leftists who celebrated what happened on October 7, that's the day Hamas perpetrated the massacre and hostage-taking and evidently rape, and you say that you are instead you know, addressing those who treated this absolute nightmare as an unfortunate situation that we had coming or who stayed silent, who were so quick to lecture us about context and resistance from the comfort of your homes, who were so eager to share hot takes, calling us losers who don't understand decolonization, while terrorists were still hunting down survivors to finish the job. So, Yuval, why did you write this Medium post, and uh, what's the main message you, you wanted to convey? I started writing in in the very beginning of this recent round, I guess, in Israel and Gaza on October 7th. And I think a lot of that was because I felt, I wouldn't even say surprised, I felt, I would say shocked um, by the reaction from a lot of people that I have worked closely with or that have been, you know, I felt like allies in in some of these um, struggles or these areas. Or people are just my friends, my people, I guess, and you know, my family, my friends, people I've grown up with have just gone through the worst thing uh, that has really ever happened in our country. And as someone who, again, has been involved with this type of work for a long time, I don't know if I should have expected it more, but I was honestly caught very off guard by the difficult responses that I got. This is not something that should be so hard for people who oppose occupation, people who oppose um, you know, um, punishing whole populations for what their governments are doing, people who oppose killing innocent people, right? Things that I would think are pretty basic. It shouldn't be this hard to to figure out what to do or what to say in this kind of situation. And yeah, I was very surprised by the responses that were extremely quick to try to justify it, to try to explain to us why it's not so bad or why we can't um, criticize it. It's just, you know, it feels a little bit ridiculous to say like, oh, you can't criticize the fact that 1,200 people were just murdered. But that really was the message. And obviously, like just denying what happened, people are still refusing to believe a lot of the stuff that happened. And I wanted to talk about how I think it creates so much damage to the, you know, the actual struggle of trying to end occupation, trying to end the siege of Gaza, and trying to actually if, achieve peace instead of going back and forth like this every couple of years. At the end of the day, like what's going to happen in Israel and Palestine is going to be between Israelis and Palestinians. We're we're all going to stay there. There's not going to be no one's going to leave. No one's going to be eradicated. We're all going to stay there. One of the biggest things that was very strange about this is to see American activists who are you know, living at one of the most successful sites of genocide and colonization, showing such disregard to something because they see it as a part of decolonization, right? Obviously, people don't actually think that because if their family got, you know, <laughs> got slaughtered for what happened to Native Americans here, I don't think they would be so forgiving. That That's a lot of damage to a struggle where two people will have to live side by side or together for forever, because again, none of us have another place to go. Um, and yeah, I think being willing to, to at least process that and hear that is really important if you're going to understand not just the situation as it is, but the solution that we might get to. How prevalent were such reactions from the Western leftists? Was it a few people? Was it the bulk of what you were experiencing? And since some of this seems to be, you know, defensible on its own, like, you know, we need to understand the context and the history of things, blah, blah, blah. It might be helpful to say exactly uh, what your problem with these kinds of reactions is. 
yeah, so I I think yeah, these reactions as a whole were I would say very prevalent. I would say in the majority of you know the voices that I have heard um, with. I think, yeah, the one about providing context being um, maybe, you know, the <laughs> the least offensive one to me, because it is true, right? Like, it is, this is, the Israeli left has been saying for years that this situation is not um, sustainable. That doesn't mean that it excuses what Hamas did, right? It just means that if we want to prevent it, we need to be realistic about the the situation that that Gaza was put in and that allowed this kind of extremism to develop there. But I think it's about actually allowing yourself to sit for a moment with the the trauma that unfolded um, upon so many people and so many families and allowing yourself to to do this thing that seems so wrong, which is having empathy for the people that you, you know, perceive as the the strong side as the colonizers, as the occupiers, as the oppressors of Palestine. To look and see that okay, at the end of the day, there's just like just people there with their families, just trying to live their lives, right? So I think there was kind of a fear of showing that kind of that kind of empathy, almost as if it would take away from what happened or will happen um, in Gaza. And I think that's wrong. First of all, just on a human level, I think that's wrong. I also think that's wrong because um, empathy and and belief in people's, you know, right to be safe and live their lives freely and safely is not something that you, it's not a resource that you run out of. It's the other way around. The more you give, the more you have, you're not going to run out of empathy to Gaza because you have empathy for the people who live in the south of Israel. And I think that this kind of, this knee-jerk reaction of trying to explain it away was an attempt to avoid having to, to hold that uncomfortable position all of a sudden when you're saying oh maybe not everything is actually okay as long as you say that it's resistance right that's not something that i think a white american feels comfortable saying a white american leftist feels comfortable saying because that's that's playing to the speaking points of israeli asbara and it's you know it's what joe biden would say and it feels like you're you're joining in on the obvious like a liberal talking point instead of doing something more radical and I think that sometimes you need to, when something is this extreme, you maybe need to state the obvious before you you move on to explaining why this happened. What you're criticizing was majority, the bulk of the reaction that you experienced, yes? Yeah. But at the time, you were surprised by it. And now you seem like not only not surprised, but you have like real theoretical understanding of the terrain and why it is so hard for that kind of leftist to show empathy, if indeed they have empathy. I mean, yeah, I think you've got it all worked out now. I mean, I spent a lot of time thinking about it. And I actually, like, at first, I, like, when it was just happening, I thought, I was like, did something, like, break in my brain? Like, am I not, like, did I turn right wing? But then I started seeing very, very similar sentiments from other Israelis that I know. And a lot of folks, you know, and also Palestinian citizens of Israel that I know people have been involved in some of these circles who said kind of the same thing. They're like, wait, 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 what? There was this whole discussion around like what, like what is the American left saying? What's the European left saying? And everyone was kind of like trying to, we were trying to help each other understand why this reaction happened. If you put two Israeli leftists together right now who live abroad somewhere, this is what they'll start talking about. For a long time, we were kind of just like in shock from our friends, from our allies um, about what had happened. And it wasn't everyone. I will say that. Like, it definitely wasn't everyone. I think it was just a lot more people than any of us expected. You will, you talk about their feeling totally misaligned with a leftist uh, milieu that can be so anti-empathetic and in some cases very sadistic. Does this uh, does this tendency and and this revealing of a real sadistic streak in the Western left damage anti occupation efforts in Israel? Yeah, so I think that's definitely one of the biggest concerns, and uh, I think one of the things I mentioned is how it almost you know it plays to this extreme right wing rhetoric that we see in Israel, which is that 
no one will protect us, that, you know, the world is out to get us, that no one cares about our lives. Everything that happens here in the activist movement is visible to Israelis. And, you know, people ask me if I feel safe in New York um, and if I feel safe speaking Hebrew in the in the street and people asking if it's okay for them to wear a yarmulke or whatever. So people really see it and see it as a as a proof that the anti-occupation activists don't care about Israelis' well-being, right? That if this is the price that Israel needs to pay to end occupation, then then that's that makes sense. And in what world would anyone in Israel ever accept that, right? You turn it into this zero-sum game where one side has to win. Anyone would choose their own side, right? And the whole point to me of of joint Israeli Palestinian Jewish Palestinian uh, struggle is to show that it's not a zero sum game. It's the opposite. No normal citizen, civilian on either side benefits from it. Obviously, Palestinians have paid an incredibly high price throughout the last seventy five years for the occupation, but Israel Israelis have paid a price as well because. We live in a very militarized society because of this, because we have to put so many resources and so much effort towards maintaining this. Um, so we only stand to benefit from ending it and from actually having real peace and not just kind of managing the occupation, managing the conflict, whatever you want to call it. So when you take it and you turn it into, well, you know, this is a part of the struggle. It's not as bad as what has happened in Palestine. You show this sort of like nonchalant approach to our lives. And Israelis, as silly as it might have sounded before October 7th, fear for our lives constantly. Um, even if it's more dangerous, obviously, to be in Gaza, that doesn't really help you when you're, you know, under rockets or scared of terrorist attacks or whatever. I think you've had before talked to some folks from Standing Together, which is a movement I really like that focuses on. Israeli Jews and Palestinian citizens of Israel that work together mainly in the mixed cities, meaning like cities that have large Palestinian and Israeli populations like Haifa. And they have been kind of a beacon of, of hope in this whole situation. And they talk about how we need to build a popular movement for ending the occupation and for justice, even if it means that it's not perfect, even if it means that we can't get all of what we consider justice under uh, under our solution, but they talk about how we we need to work together and see that our our liberation, our freedom, our safety are all tied together. And I think that any point that doesn't just clearly, I don't know, condemns. I I don't know that I need everyone to be condemning everything all the time, but it doesn't establish a baseline understanding of what justice looks like for both people. Doesn't have a realistic solution, and only has for us a continuation of this back and forth for generations to come. I mean, I, I agree with you that people don't need to, have, to be condemning everything all, all the time. The problem is when there is condemnation and vociferous and sustained condemnation, but it's all one-sided. You know, so I think that that's that's really the issue here. You know, when um, people are so concerned to line up and they're treating it, like you say, as like a zero-sum game, uh, and they're basically saying, well, you know, the rest of you people, well, you're collateral damage, and, you know, that's the way the cookie crumbles. That's, that's, a, that's a big problem. You kind of, like, dropped everything and worked out your thoughts starting on October 7th. And finally produced this medium post, but also a couple of people from standing together, uh, Sally Abed and uh, Alonely Green, I think they did or are still on a tour of the U.S. It was written up in the New York Times. They were basically saying, you people aren't helping, you know, and if you're not helping, shut the F up, you know, and they were, they were addressing it, I think, to the same kind of people that were addressing your post that. Have you been following that or do you have any thoughts on that? I think Staying Together is a really good representation of people who could not have more skin in the game, right, on both sides. And I think that's why they're so powerful. And they talk a lot about, about that joint liberation and about how um, 
like they're trying to kind of fight the escalation that's happening in Israel. And then their tour here, I think, yeah, focused a lot on one, like, what are actual solutions on the ground that go beyond slogans, that go beyond like a cool infographic that you can share? Like what are actual like political movements that are trying to solve this? Like there's another great organization that I've been following for many years is Combatants for Peace, which is an organization founded by former IDF soldiers and former like Palestinian folks who used to be in Israeli prisons for involvement in military actions against Israel. And they also post, you know, through all of this, their conversations with each other, their ability to hold each other's um, pain and fear, even in the face of some of the worst times that any of us have seen. And I think that's extremely powerful. Um, And yeah, like I mentioned, staying together focuses on building a popular demand for peace. So I watched their their talk in, in New York. And one of the things that Sally talks about is how, as a Palestinian, she could choose to um, to withhold herself from this conversation. She could choose to not engage with Israeli Jews. She can she can decide that she's just going to say, you liberate me, and until then I'm not even going to talk to you. But that that kind of takes her power away, and that it means that she's just left waiting for this liberation to come from someone else. And that what she chooses to do instead is to actually engage in the society that she lives in, which is the Israeli-Palestinian society, and actually be a part of the solution. And obviously, you know, I'm Jewish-Israeli, so that puts me in a very different position, but I feel, I felt like that really spoke to me, like this idea that you can be, you can choose to be righteous and perfect and achieve all your, or want to achieve all your goals, or you can work with the people who are actually around you, are actually going to have to be a part of the solution. And I remember you, you mentioned three groups on, on Medium. One that you thought was doing good work was Standing Together. Another is Combatants for Peace. And the third one? I might have talked about Breaking the Silence, which is mainly an Israeli organization that collects testimonies from Israeli soldiers about their service. And they've been um, really instrumental in helping Israelis understand what the occupation actually entails. There's other organizations like Women Wage Peace, which lost some of its members on October 7th uh, and, you know, focus on on women opposing a war. So, Yuval, you seem to be suggesting that the best way to combat the anti-democratic extreme right-wing forces in Israel is for there to be international solidarity with those on the ground directly opposing those forces. Why do you, do you think Western leftists are so uninterested in building that kind of solidarity? A lot of the times it's easier to just identify what's the, what's the right, quote unquote, right team and choose that. Uh, it's just more simple. And I think social media kind of really accelerates that process because you literally see what people are posting and it kind of feels like you need to get in line or you become a part of the problem, right? There's very little room for nuance. And then I think, I think that there is like a reluctance to, um, to, to voice something that might sound, I think I said before, like might sound like liberal or, or moderate or not subversive enough. And when it's something like this that happens to a people that we perceive as the, you know, the strong ones, the ones that shouldn't, um, that aren't deserving of of solidarity, then it's easy to just say, yeah, that's not that's not the main point. The main point is is this context that we have to provide. I really believe in this like mutual liberation of Israelis and Palestinians, and I think what people don't understand is exactly that point. They think that the solution to this is um, is solidarity between the world and Palestinians. When really the, the solution is going to be solidarity between Israelis and Palestinians. Uh, and there's no other way that this gets solved, again, without mass displacement or eradication of, of a whole ethnicity of people. I kind of see it the same as when we talk about sexism. The, the solution to sexism is not for men to be more oppressed than women or for men to be oppressed at all. The solution is for us to find an alternative way of relating to each other that doesn't involve that dynamic. 
And I think that's just become not a very popular idea. Uh, maybe it doesn't translate well over social media. Or maybe it just feels not radical enough. Almost like, yeah, you watch a sports game and you choose which team you're rooting for. Whatever situation arises, you know your team colors and you wear them and you wave them. And it's not necessarily even just social media. It's the whole, the whole society. Here on the west side of Manhattan, we have a thing called West Side Spirit. And this teacher wrote in and she, she's talking about her students. And they asked her, are you on Team Israeli or are you on Team Palestinian? And she said, I'm on Team Humanity. And it's just like when I read your, your post, the tears are welling up. When I read that, tears are welling up. We just wish people would get something so basic. Yeah, it's it's really strange. I think it, especially when people are doing this exercise, when they're kind of like, they're telling me, like they're comparing the numbers on the deaths on the Israeli side and the Palestinian side, right? There's an historic injustice. More people on the other side have died, and we have to correct this historic injustice by killing more of the people on your side. You, you don't get it? Right. right. Exactly. And that's one of the things that made like a reaction on October 7th so bizarre is that people had this resistance to saying like, okay, this is bad. We've seen how, you know, big bursts of, of you know, what can be called or is labeled by these sorts of leftists, decolonial violence usually go and it's not good. We have tons of psychological studies that that perpetrating this sort of violence for either side in these conflicts is not helpful. It's uh, deeply damaging and it leaves people limited capabilities, empathy for the rest of their lives, along with other things. You know, that's exactly what a group like what you're describing about combatants for peace is is trying to show that the endless violence is is not helping anyone, but there's still this tendency to cheerlead violence and, and say, yeah, let's let's get the, the away the away uh, team's scoreboard more even with the home team. And it's it's really maddening. They're thinking about it as one team versus another or as a zero sum game. And what you're talking about in these organizations you indicate are talking about is thinking differently. Is such a change in thinking on, on an international scale is it is it possible? I think it's the only it's the only possibility. I think that um I don't think it's going to come from our leaders necessarily um, because normally, you know, they, they stand to benefit more than the rest of us. And from these kinds of extreme situations, Hamas benefits from Netanyahu and Netanyahu benefits from Hamas, as he has said before himself. But I think that there is a point in which people will understand that it's that we have no other choice and that it's not worth it. For a long time, Israel and Palestine were compared to um, to England and Ireland, and I kind of look to that as as a hope. Even though you know we might never all be best friends and get along perfectly, um, clearing the bar of physical safety and freedom for for both sides of this would be such a big gain. This issue of context has been raised, and colonization and decolonization has been raised. And I think there's like a really important point that you made in your Medium post. I think it would benefit a lot of our listeners. A lot of people just don't know the, the history of the region very well. So you say to the Western leftists, Duval, you say, unlike many of your colonial ancestors, we did not come to Palestine out of some imperial dream. We didn't come to conquer or even to find a better life. We came as refugees. Uh, so I take it that you're not saying that Israel isn't occupying Palestinian territory. Uh, when you discuss why most Israeli Jews immigrated to Israel, what is the actual point you're trying to make? Yeah, so I, a lot of that is focused around the yeah, decolonization topic. And the point was that it's not, you know, like England sending people to occupy and colonize India, or it's not like France going to Algeria to try to expand its empire, right? This was individual people who escaped pogroms, who escaped the Holocaust, who escaped the Fahud in the Middle East, who went there and did end up getting a state from a colonial power, which is England, which was controlling it at the time. They didn't come there 
to expand some existing empire. That doesn't mean that, it, okay, obviously people were, you know, displaced from their homes, were killed. There was a lot of violence around the formation of Israel. And I don't mean to excuse that, but what I mean to really drive, the point I mean to really drive is that we have nowhere else to go. And I think I did not realize that this is maybe something a lot of people misunderstand about Israel. You'll see people say things like, so just move to the country you were born in, move back. And we're like, well, <laughs> this is the country we were born in. But my truth might be true that my grandparents weren't born there, but my parents were. They've never lived anywhere else. And most Jews in Israel are from Arab countries originally. And they can't go back, right? They're not going back to Yemen. They're not going back to Syria. So my point was decolonization, whatever that means to you, it needs to include all of these people getting to stay in the country because that's where we're from. We can try to correct what's happened in the last 75 years, but we can't undo it and we're not going to displace further to try to correct this. That's just not the answer. We're going to, like I said, figure out a way for all of these people on both sides to stay there because none of them have anywhere else. The occupation of you know, the West Bank is more similar to traditional like settler colonialism and is one of the things that we fight against most fiercely, the expansion of uh, the settlements. So I think your point is that people who come to a country as refugees who have nowhere else to go and so they go there, they are not coming to the country as part of of, for the purpose of assisting the settler colonial project. Now, you mentioned that most Israeli Jews are actually from the Eastern communities. And so people have heard of the, the Holocaust, which, you know, happened in Europe, and pogroms, which is generally a reference to, to Europe. But you also mentioned the Farhud, and I think that's not very well known what you're talking about. So maybe you could elaborate. There have been Jews all around the Middle East, right, for a very long time. And it was peaceful at times, and a lot of times it was not peaceful at all. So the Fahud was in Iraq in the early 40s. There were pogroms or, you know, violent riots against, against the Jewish population there, where I think, you know, it's in the hundreds up to a thousand or so people died there. But there's a long history uh, of Jews in essentially every Middle Eastern country being prosecuted and, you know, having to leave and go most of the time to Israel or Palestine at the time. Obviously not as organized and quite as extreme as the Holocaust, but that's a big part of how, you know, the Middle Eastern Jews came to Israel. So and we're talking about really how how bad the situation is and that the only real lasting solution that's not the expulsion of 7 million people from you know one population or the other is for the people to come to some understanding with one another and live together but how prevalent is this sentiment how how realistic is it to uh, to, to think that there's a way out of this I do think there's a way out of it because um, it's not sustainable, right? We've seen it. We've seen the escalation get worse. I think that this has been the clearest sort of failure of any government in Israeli history, but especially of Netanyahu, who has um, positioned himself as, as Mr. Security, right? His old campaign slogans and videos are, are looking really interesting now. And I do think that he is the biggest obstacle to, to Israeli peace. And it's been almost impossible to, uh, to get rid of him. But I think this is where Netanyahu ends his time in Israeli politics. I think that's a part of why this war has been taking so long, because he knows that very well. He knows that as soon as this ends, he will be out. But I think that people at the end of the day look out for their own interest. They realize now that Netanyahu and his extremely right wing government is not it. Um, and I think that we need to be there to offer the alternative. I think the US 
has to play a role in this. Biden clearly wants to show that he's a friend of Israel. Not because, you know, Americans necessarily like us, but because we're a military asset to the U.S. The U.S. is not doing this because of the Jewish lobby or anything like that. But if the U.S. decided to apply pressure to Israel, um, and I think it will have to, then I do think that it will be inevitable that we find maybe not a perfect solution. Two states, one state, three states, zero state, whatever it is, anything is better. At this point, I'm not even I, I'm not even opinionated anymore. I just want it to end. So what's the opposite? What should people in the Western left do to make the situation better rather than worse? And in your experience, has any of that been, been happening thus far? I think people should make sure that the information they're getting, number one, is true, because that's one of the most frustrating things about this is seeing folks who rely so heavily on social media and they don't know where what they're posting is coming from, if it's true or if it's not. This includes, you know, questioning whether there actually was sexual violence. I think it's important to check in with yourself and try to approach this instead of from vantage point of righteousness. Approach it from a vantage point of compassion and humanity. I know that it's a big ask. I've been recommending to people really like to sit and imagine like if your sister or your mom or your friend was living in Gaza right now, what would that be like? If they were living in the south of Israel on October 7th, what would that be like? If you're if they were hostage in Gaza, what would that be like? And then focus on the people who are there on the ground, focus on the organizations and the messages that are coming out of Israel, Palestine, and Gaza, instead of on things that your fellow activists are are saying, and and stay productive, I would say. Don't be focused on trying to make the person you know feel bad for what they believe in. Focus on what do you think is actually a productive solution, I would say, in this point in time. You know, two obvious things are ceasefire and the hostage release. Focus on that as opposed to explaining to someone you know who might have said something about someone about Israel or about Palestine, explain to them how they're wrong. And then on a personal level, there really is nothing easier than being kind and supportive to people that you know in private. I think that's one of the things that was most shocking about this. Like, if you can get along with your one friend who maybe said something like this once, how are Israel and Palestine ever going to have peace? You don't need to educate people who are directly affected by this. That's not where you should put your energy. Put your energy and focus on the American government, because that's where you're you know, your money and your vote goes. Thank you so much for coming on the show. I really appreciate it. This needed to be said, and I'm glad you did. Yeah, I'm, I really appreciate you having me. I did not expect this to actually get this kind of traction. I kind of wrote it just kind of for my friends to see. I got a little over 400 responses, and then it's something like 60,000 views, something like that. It's really nice to talk to folks who are We've been in this, <laughs> in the world of activism for a long time and, you know, get why this was like so shocking to us and, um, you know, believe that we all deserve better. I really appreciate it. Thank you very much for, for coming on the show, sharing your experiences and thoughts with us. I know how difficult it must be even to talk about this once more. <laughs> You've been listening to episode 106 of Radio Free Humanity, the Marxist Humanist podcast from deep within capitalist society. Thank you for listening. Please do keep checking us out to listen to future episodes of this podcast series. Also, please visit MarxistHumanistInitiative.org to listen to past episodes, to learn more about the issues we discuss, to comment, and to donate to our cause. Thank you very much.